Thank you, Martha, for a very interesting introduction. So nice to have you with us today. Please welcome also Mrs. Sara Martikka, lecturer in Finnish language and literature. Mr. Oliver Rotko, who is the founder of the YouTube channel Road to Finnish, and Jen Nischel from Mobile Story Sweden, who you already know. So, Sara, you are a teacher and you have first-hand experience as a Gen Z educator. In your work, have you seen some of the cultural trends Martha highlighted? Yes, yes I, yes, I have, and there are a lot of things that are, are common among my students as well. Uh, especially that, that they do uh, see a lot of content all the time. They live their life in social media and different and in platforms, and uh, well, the first-hand info comes from there, and then they might seek deeper, but yeah. How have you adjusted your teaching in response? Well, we do have a media literacy in our curriculum, so it is in there in yes. every subject, not just mine, which is Finnish and literature. But well, I try to use those things that they see every day, like TikTok and other platforms that are popular among teenagers. Interesting. How do you use TikTok in teaching? Uh, well, as a, well, as a content, we might analyze videos, for example. Yes. Uh, they show me something and we talk it together, perhaps use some tools to analyze content, yeah, that's that important. kind of stuff. Yeah, very interesting. Oliver, you may not be a Gen Z yourself, but you are a YouTube creator whose content appeals to that generation, right? Mm. Yes. What do you think about these trends, horror, memes, fandom, uh, videos, of course, <laughs> talking about culture, becoming culture, and videos make people feel they are in another place. Are they familiar to you? Yeah, Do you use yes. them? Videos, of course, but something else. I actually don't use these themes myself, but these are very familiar. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, they, they are everywhere. And uh, especially with Gen Z, it's, 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 these are very important topics. Um, I think what is very important to, to understand about the Gen Z and, and these themes, especially the, the sense of belonging, is that this is something that is very near and dear to them. It, it's, it's how these, this generation is built. And, and instead of kind of fighting against it, we need to kind of embrace it and then learn to, how, do, how should I say, cope with it uh, with the right tools. Mm. And, and this way we can not only teach the younger generation's media literacy, but we will also learn uh, their media literacy yes. in a sense. So it's very, it's a dialogue. It's a dialogue, yeah. very well said. Yes, you've been talking a lot about misinformation on online. What have you learned about how this generation processes information and misinformation? Well, there's a million ways to look at this, but what I would like to take uh, or, or say here is, is uh, what is pretty prevalent is, is something called you know, media bubbles and even uh, something called audience capture. Yes. Uh, where, um, let's take as, a, as an example, if, if you're talking about, let's say, politics. And, and you talk uh, about politics from a certain perspective, and you notice that that's not really gripping because you know everything. All the algorithmic social media ch uh, platforms like TikTok, YouTube, etc., are are uh, driven by e engagement. And, and if you notice that your message, as it comes truly from you, doesn't really you know um, uh, get off the ground, you might pivot s slightly and, and give a bit of bit of more of a controversial take on something. And if t that takes off. Then, then what happens is, is this phenomena called audience capture, where you have to follow the audience where they go. And this can be a bit dangerous, depending on, on, on what kind of content you are uh, doing. And, and of course, from here, we come to the discussion of you know, ethics of content creation and, and the, the, um, your own thoughts about what you're talking about. Fine. Jenny, Mobile Stories has been active in source criticism training for the last three years, as we heard earlier today. And you told us earlier that you've trained over 10,000 youth and teens. This was especially important, of course, in 2022, given your national election, right? It was from, yeah, mostly. Yes. What has Mobile Stories learned about keys to engaging and helping this gener generation to better identify and build resilience to misinformation? I think that um, <clears throat> to be able to uh, spot mi misinformation uh, and also to be able to, to identify credible information, you mm. need to 
produce material yourself. Uh, and uh, we have a, a researcher in Sweden called Thomas Nygren. Uh, maybe you've heard about him. And he has developed a game called the Bad News Game, uh, where students get to be disinformants. They produce uh, disinformation and learn the techniques and the mindset and everything. Mm. And he, had shown, he has shown that uh, young people who have played this game increases their ability to spot misinformation online. Uh, and uh, we have seen that this is also where wor this works the other way around. That if you if you're taught to if you you're um, invited to participate and to to create credible information and to work with journalistic methods, for example, uh, you also increase your ability to identify uh, other credible sources online. Mm. Uh, Martha, I believe you have done research at Jigsaw. Um, about how this generation evaluate information online, haven't you? Can you tell us something about that? Yeah, I think that was, you know, what I was sort of just getting to at the end there mm. about, you know, how the, the opinions shape and they evolve. It's sort of, you don't, the Gen Z maybe doesn't go in looking for a very clear right or wrong. Mm. Um, it's kind of they want enough of uh, knowledge to be able to communicate with their friends, to have a point of view, to mm. kind of take a side, but that can change over time. And that's where I think the engagement with the content and when you see something going viral and how content continues to change and mm. there's more engagement around it, their perceptions could change yes. with that content. And so um, it's why, you know, paying attention to like the meme upon the meme or the commentator on the moment is just as important as the moment itself. Mm. Sara and Jenny, what are your suggestions on how educators and media literacy organizations can help them to, uh, to navigate and interpret the information they find? Yeah, uh, I think that it's very important to not just talk about fact-checking and, and debunking, but focus more on uh, trust-building. Yes. Uh, and I think also to inspire young people and to, to let them, uh, uh, give them an experience of what dem democracy is about and let them use the democracy uh, and see what, what it can be used for. And, and so that they are uh, really um, know what it's what is at stake here, because I think most most young people know that disinformation is bad, uh, but maybe they don't really know why it's bad. Uh, and I think that we can inspire them more and tell stories about our values, our democratic values, and that they have an important role to play in this information war online that we're, we're in and make them feel important. Uh, and, that, and then maybe they, <laughs> you, you, you get more engaged in this, uh, in this war that we're actually in on the internet. Uh, if you see your own important role uh, for building resilience for your country and for your values. Mm. Can I well, add to that? I think it's so important what you say and why it's interesting because like if you try and market to Gen Z, they hate that. <laughs> it's like they see through you. They know you're trying to like get to their level and it's got to feel authentic and it's got to feel organic and you know we need them to be talking to each other and the people they care about and the people they respect. And obviously they respect the parents to a certain extent and they, expect their, they respect their networks, but their, their community is number one. And so educating them has to come mm. from within and empowering them to be authentic voices for themselves. Yes, of course. Sarah, how do you help them navigate and interpret the information? Well, we do a lot of different things, but there could be like short uh, checklists or uh, ways to analyze, like really easy ones. But I just want to say I really do agree with Jenny with the we need to get them involved. And also they realize that this is really like a big thing. At least my students talk about it a lot, that they need to know like what is truth, of course, but also what is going on. Like you said, that it's like the most important thing or most important stuff that they look from, for example, from TikTok. Mm -hmm. But I think the, 
basic educational level has to be good, but it all comes down to the reading skills, the skills that they mm. cope with the world. Mm. I think that's like the core of the yes. media literacy. Yeah. Yes, that's so true. <laughs> if, you, if you can't read, mm -hmm. if you don't have literacy skills, yeah. then you don't have media literacy skills. Yeah. It's very it, simple, but... Yeah, it is. If you don't recognize the text, if mm. you don't see the, if you don't know how to read the picture or video. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Oliver, as a creator of, of uh, content that appeals to, to this generation, uh, what do you feel is the responsibility of the creative community, not just on YouTube, but mm -hmm. on all platforms? Um, I think I will be somewhere in be basically in between you two. Um, I, I think media literacy skills, teaching younger generations how to read, how to interpret what you hear, yeah. um, and, and how, how, no, how not to necessarily accept and agree on everything that you hear from your own or, um, 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 a cultural group. That, that's of course number one, and that comes to the education system and, and parenting and so on. But at the same time, of course, I, I, I feel that content creators and, and especially you know, those who call themselves influencers have all the responsibility in the world to um, do things ethically. However, the problem is that we are not able to collectively control people who push or uh, not push but publish content online because we're not only talking about creators but we are talking about normal people. Who, who might be uh, taking part in, for, exa for example, misinformation spreading. So I think it's a combination of, of everything. It's, it's about yeah. uh, education, it's about uh, content moderation, it's about actual uh, um, educating the content creators themselves how to work in a more ethical manner. Mm. And, and the, the big, big risk here that we have is, is overdoing one of these three which can actually fight against, it, against it, itself, uh, for example, through content moderation. If we have misinformation on, on topic A, and then we have people who spread the misinformation, and, and we have people who are trying to debunk it. If we have, um, let's say, an algorithmic moderation tool, so to say, and we try to moderate this overall overarching topic, we might actually also mm -hmm. moderate the people who are trying to, trying to fight against them. And, and that happens because the, the amount of content is so vast. So it's an impossible question uh, mm. to answer. Yeah, that's true. Martha, what is the role of, of tech companies and what are Google and YouTube? What are they doing? Or you doing? <laughs> well, there's a lot of things. Um, I don't have the details on all the things. I think that um, part of it is helping facilitate discussions like today, mm. first of all, because again, as a creator, as an educator, you're closest to the audience in some ways. And so I think hearing from the communities and understanding where you need the most help is a big part of that puzzle. Obviously on the platform, you know, there's a lot of things we do to remove uh, content that violates misinformation policies, whether we, you know, have, you know, partnerships to have fact-checking uh, organizations uh, that we work with, uh, whether we do things like Auntie talked about earlier today, bringing forward trust and content, whether that's an election and you know directing a voter with the right date to the election authority or raising content that from the WHO about COVID. Um, you know, on YouTube, there's also you know, things like trusted flaggers. And so there's a lot of steps. I think that the trick is getting ahead of the bad actors is always the biggest challenge. Um, and the fact that just like the media landscape is constantly evolving, the solutions to get after the bad actors have to constantly evolve. And so what worked yesterday might not work tomorrow. So I'd say it takes a humility and understanding that, mm. you know. And your responsibility is huge. Huge responsibility. Mm. But with that comes also the humility that Mm. We don't have all of the answers, and so it's being an active participation in the forums to understand how we can leverage all of the networks best and be a good partner in monitoring where we can and doing what we can on our platforms. Mm. What about artificial intelligence that is coming now really, really big 
into Well, I was lives. so curious about your yeah. meerkat. I mean, yeah. I think that sounds amazing. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's funny because people think about AI or, you know, chat bots, and they think, like, oh, what's going on? A friend of mine had some post on Facebook, like, if I could just get AI to do my laundry, that would be fantastic. Um, you know, the beauty of AI, though, I live in Denmark, and my Danish is not good. And, you know, there's AI behind Google Translate, and I'm so deeply grateful for that. So I think that there are very great opportunities. And I think there's a really interesting study. I wish I could remember who it was from, but it actually looked at, you know, millennials and Gen Z as potentially the generation that can use AI most effectively to go after things like misinformation. Mm. And I think there's tremendous opportunity if we look at sort of the positive power of something like AI from the users. Because I will say that in all of those trends and data, and as a parent, one thing I'm so delighted to see that I think could be beneficial is that this is a very curious group, mm. right? Like, you know, they're curious, they are resourceful. I mean, they go to so many different platforms and cross platforms and communities. And so, you know, how do you maybe leverage that curiosity in a very positive way and leverage tools and resources to help them, as you said, like own the solution? Mm -hmm. mm. So that's not an answer. I think it's more sort of like the yeah. framework for the answer. Yes. But I, I'm actually encouraged yes. by the evolution in technology with the patterns that we see on the platforms mm -hmm. and maybe also just from personal experience in my own house yeah. um, that, uh, <laughs> that, you know, I, I think it could be good. If I may very quickly on AI, I, I, I totally agree that we might find interesting solutions to tackle misinformation using AI once the technology is far enough. Mm. But the pro of, of course, there's been a lot of discussion mm. about using chat GPT, for example, to cheat in education, yeah. which is a problem that they can solve through technology. But at the same time, I actually spent a few days trying to push the, the version that was still online two weeks ago quite far when in, in my own sphere of Finnish education system. and. and and, and all the information regarding that. And you don't actually have to go too far before these AI tools start pushing information that is not necessarily nefarious, but false. And so we, we also, especially considering the, the, the rapid speed, speed that these tools are developing, mm. we have to start educating mm -hmm. and responding to them by sharing information to the younger generation about these tools, the positives and the negatives, yes. and how to use them so that they don't go inside rabbit holes of yeah. false information. Yes, yes. But the responsibility is huge, as we said. It is. And then we have uh, the families as well, of course. Uh, what is the role of parents in all of this? What about Jenny? How do you reach out to parents? Or do you reach out to parents? I'm a parent myself. <laughs> but uh, fortunately, I, I don't even have to ask my children to explain things to me because they come with their phones all the time and want to show me and tell me, uh, I think, most things that happen in their digital lives. Um, but I think that is the trick. And I think what I've done is to start talking about those things quite early. Uh, and uh, finding uh, time where this discussion can take place. Uh, and I think that's the same as for, for teachers and, and for school uh, librarians or for the health team at school to find time where you, you as a young person know that in this time I can, I can talk, to the, talk about these subjects. Uh, I think that that is very important because I think that young people want to talk about it. Mm. Uh, they they just need to know that someone is curious and wants mm. to listen and uh, that you have the, the time to listen. Do you have the same experience, Sara? Yes, yes, I do. And I think sometimes uh, parents or older people think like TikTok, it's not useful. That's mm. a waste of time. It's just entertainment. <laughs> and uh, there are a lot of good stuff there as well. And it's really important the thing that you're heard, you're seen, mm -hmm. that, well, this is in interesting for me, that is also for my social group, my parents or grandparents, who else. We can learn a lot from there, and also we get the mindset from there as well, so we get to know what they really 
think or what do they like. And I think it's like super important. And it's also so so interesting and it educational is. for grown-ups, I think, because it says yeah. something about the future when you it listen is. to where the kids yeah. are and their activities. You know something about where society is uh, yeah. on its way. So yeah. mm -hmm. it could be different kind of perspective or way to see the world. So I think that's really important to see how the teenagers see the mm. surroundings these days. That's so true. Do we have any questions from the audience? By can the I way? add one thing to yes. the parents? Yes, yeah, you can add. And if, uh, but before that, if anybody has to, yeah, we have one hand up there. So just a minute, we, Martha, I'll be, I'll be really turn. quick. And I think mm. that you, you know, you said, one of you said the curiosity. And I think that, you know, as a parent, I'm speaking from a parent right yeah. now that, you know, as you said, like, oh, what is that TikTok mm. or, uh, and, for a parent to show curiosity and interest and not shut it down or be judgmental about it. Mm. Like, if my daughter asks me to be in a TikTok video, then absolutely, you know, you have to have no shame. But <laughs> I think they, then that opens the dialogue and that's when you can then have the pointed questions that maybe then dig deeper into making them think a little bit more critically. But mm. it won't happen if you, yeah, um, it doesn't go away. Yeah. No, 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 not at all. Sorry. Yeah, you go. Hi, thank you. Um, I was really interested around sharing and commenting online and how that can help young people decipher from right or wrong or sort of form their opinions. But I'm also very aware of cancel culture being talked about constantly. Um, and, you know, if a Gen Zer grows up to be a politician, you're guaranteed that someone's going to trawl through their history of comments and sharing. Um, is there much discussion around the considerations for how their discussions might be looked at in the future? Who wants to answer that? Comments Maybe the sharing. curator? Yeah. <laughs> Oliver, I'm, you I'm are quite to... familiar with that, yes, aren't yes. you? Yes, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, <laughs> the, the, there are discussions about this and, and how to deal with this. Um, to be honest, I actually don't know how to even answer the question because it's, it's such a complicated topic and this is such a new phenomenon, if we think about it, um, and how this is going to, be, going to play a role in the future in, in 10 years, 15 years, when, when you know, Gen Z is, is going to be in, in these positions that you mentioned. Um, so it's going to be very interesting to see and super, super difficult question. I actually don't know how to answer this properly. Martha, do you have any takes? Yeah, it's, there's so many layers to it. Yeah. And I think that, you know, if you look at YouTube, for example, and one of the beauties of YouTube kids was that there are no comments. Mm. So that, you know, you can sort of, that was another protection mechanism. But, you know, a kid ages out of YouTube kids. And so at what point do the comments come on? And how does the young person process those. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of back to the, you know, whether you have a like or dislike button mm -hmm. on Facebook and, and, you know, and then YouTube took out the dislike on the videos because that would create problems. I think that, I don't think there's an easy answer. Mm. I think as a parent, it goes back to creating pathways for dialogue mm. um, so that if there's something on there that feels wrong, that there's a safe space to escalate. Oliver. Maybe I can actually build on this. I, I think you, you, uh, you had a great point about not necessarily cancel, cancel culture, but the negative reactions that one gets on social media, regardless of, of whether you're doing content professionally or as a hobby, or there's something that you do just then and there. there. Especially with teenagers and, and you know, younger people who, who don't have necessarily the experience of dealing with, you know, strict negative or even, you know, not even criticism, but very, very negative comments. It, it, it really hits you hard. And there's, there's a common saying, especially with con content creators, you can have a 99 excellent, lovely comments that say that you're beautiful and, and wonderful in what you do. And there is one, one comment. comment that I'm is sure negative. You're, you, yes. you know the same. Uh, one comment that says you're ugly and that can destroy your week. Absolutely yes. destroy. That you and I are ugly. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> and, and and the same same thing with the with the dislike button. Mm. There were and it's only one. Mm. Exactly, mm. Um, but at the same time, cancel culture is also something that is going is is nowadays also, while it does have good intentions behind it, um, you know, not the term itself necessarily, but it, cancel culture itself as a concept is being used as it's been weaponized also on social media specifically for these ends. Um, and while there are positives about, uh, you know, the, the change in the culture, there are also negatives. And, and I've had my part in it because I'm trying to bring international students to Finland, which means that I am isn't this and isn't that and so not supporting the con country that I'm living in, etc., etc. And, and you have to learn and teach, teach younger uh, generations how to deal with this because this is inevitable mm. and it's going to, they're going to see it in one format or, or another now and in the future. Mm. I just don't. How do you cope with this? Well, I do know that they read the comments a lot. Yes. They talk about it a lot, and that's like another discussion about the comments, just the post itself, but also the comments. But like you said that, you know, you have to have a kind of resilience or you have to have a decent self-esteem or confidence if you do post, and they know that. I mean, mm. they are aware of that. They live there, so they've seen the comments even though they've been posting, posting and getting those comments. Mm. But yeah, we have those things in in our everyday life, in live situations, but also in there. We just have to teach them to be better. Mm. But I think there's also trends that are promising. Mm. If you think about, you know, kids posting photos where they don't look glamorous. Yeah. You know, where, you know, it's not staged. The, mm. what was it, Be Real, that yeah, app, where you just like yeah, take yeah. it in the moment no matter what you're doing. and. If you look at that and then you look at the fact that there's these multiple platforms that interact, there's multiple communities and there's communities amongst communities. And so maybe there's more checks and balances that happen due to that layering across platforms and across formats versus if it was within one yeah. silo yeah. that could be uh, maybe sort of a, a more of a regulator. Yeah. And at the same time, the, the newer generations are growing more and more international every single year. And that's great. Mm. Less silos, less division, which means you know more positive engagement mm. through these I hope platforms. So. Yeah. I hope so. We take one more question from the audience. Here you go. And remember to uh, introduce yourself. Yes. Uh, hi everyone. I'm Camilla. I come from Save the Children, and uh, we are very lucky to be also partnering with Google uh, Foundation on fighting harmful content online. So I just wanted to tap on the thing that, Marta, you said, that creating the safe space. Of course, it always comes to the situation uh, that you have a good uh, dialogue with your child. We know that at teenagers, the kids don't care what the parents say. They don't even say if something is harmful or they have seen something harmful or they feel negative. So I would just, uh, <laughs> from representation, as a representative from our organization say that, you know, parents and um, teachers and uh, everybody who engages with, uh, with children, there are available packages like uh, uh, digital parenting packages that you can also access and, you know, a lot of uh, things happening at the moment in Finland. Uh, we are, for instance, launching the Huippula program, which is the peak will uh, for all fifth graders, the teachers and parents. So. There are tools and, you know, you can tap on those. Uh, wonderful to hear about that. It's very important to have those tools and, and to use them as well. Uh, one last question before let, we let Beth Goldberg talk about pre-bunking. Um, what is one piece of advice on how to best help uh, this generation to build their misinformation resilience? We start with Jenny. Well, I talked before about the trust thing, <laughs> that you need to gain trust, and that comes for uh, established news media and the governmental authorities, that, that you need to find a way to talk to young people and gain their trust, but also a very important uh, part in this is inviting them to participate because they want to do that. Mm. 
so I, I think we, we need to start there. And then also, uh, I think that the news media have an important role to play in democratic countries, like in Sweden. Uh, and here we see, I don't know how it is in, in Finland, but in Sweden, uh, we, when we talk to teachers, a lot of them have stopped working with media in school. They used to work with a paper, with a newspaper, and teaching uh, children uh, the difference between opinion pieces and the news articles and so on. And then they stopped using the paper and didn't replace it with anything else because it, now it's too complex and mm. too, too difficult. So, but I think it, it's, it's important to have a discussion around news and current events so that you... because. Before, uh, when I was young, um, we gathered around uh, the, the morning paper and the TV, television news, and we gathered around the same social issues and got the same kind of ref frame of reference. And now it's more fragmented and mm. polarized. And I think that we need to... Uh, I don't want to say that a school has to do everything, because they already do a lot, but I think it's important to discuss news and give, give uh, uh, young people a common frame of reference mm. so that you can... And then, you, of course, you can have di different uh, views, but you have the same frame of reference so, so that you can understand each other. Uh, I think that that's an important uh, job to do. One piece of advice, Oliver. Um, I think the one thing that you learn in university is criticizing the sources that you're looking at. And we need to expand this education to all ages, um, as you've spoken. And simply uh, uh, we, we simply need to learn how to read, 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 and then criticize what we are reading. I think that's, that's the best way to do. Mm. Sara. I actually asked this from my students yesterday. Okay, good. Yeah, and they, uh, most of them told me that like the common sense, the education, basic education, that you know when you know things, when you know the world, it's so much easier to evaluate information. Mm. But I also, like I mentioned, reading skills, but also mm. we call them in our curriculum thinking skills. Mm. Yes. How to be critical, how to analyze things. Well said. So education is my answer. Yes, of surprisingly, course. <laughs> surprisingly. But you are right. <laughs> you are so right. Martha. Um, I'll go with another E word. I'll say empower. <laughs> them yeah and I, I mm. truly believe like just you know letting them take ownership giving them the space to do it their way and not mm. criticizing or judging but encouraging them to express it as creatively as they want to express it even if you don't get it you know encourage the creative approaches um, and you know give them the space to be a partner Mm. in solving it, as opposed to telling them what they should or shouldn't do. Yeah. We should listen to them as well. <laughs> They're smart. They are kids. Smart. Yes, of course. <laughs> and that also means that we parents, we have to put our phones down yeah. and, and, you know, as yes. you mentioned, listen to and them. And meet them as yeah. <laughs> face to face. Let's not only tell our kids to, to put their phones down, let's do the same. Yeah. And also, uh, I think one important point is that uh, I think that uh, young people today are very critical and, and sometimes too critical and they tend to treat all kinds of sources with the same skepticism yeah. and that goes for people of all ages today mm. and that we need to uh, understand that some, some sources are credible yes. because otherwise you can't handle the, <laughs> the media landscape and the That's what media literacy is all about yeah. actually, yes. Uh, it's going to be a hard task to tackle, of course, but I believe Beth Goldberger will have some thoughts and advice on this question as well. Now I want to thank you all for a wonderful discussion. Thank you for teaching us about this new generation, way of thinking. Uh, I wish you a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.